or we should pick up a burden, find one. You know, we live in such a day, we don't want to be burdened with anything. <clears throat> but the Lord Jesus Christ looked at Jerusalem and wept. I was on that hill there at the Mount of Olives that overlooks the city of Jerusalem. I was there, Sarah and I were there. And you can see the whole city of Jerusalem. The Bible says that he wept over that city. And when he saw the multitudes, you remember what the Bible says? He was moved with what? Compassion. It means there was something heavy on his heart. I think our Christian life sometimes becomes so light that we, we're not bearing burdens anymore. There's nothing heavy on our life anymore. There's, there's no lost loved one that we're crying about anymore. There's no needs that really break us anymore. Our, our heart becomes a little too light. And I'm not saying it should consume us, but it's good to pick up a burden every so often and just bear it to the Lord in sincerity and heaviness and ask him to help and seek an answer. Just seek an answer. And uh, that song encouraged me. Thank you very much, ladies. Luke chapter number 17, please, if you'll take your Bible and turn there with me to Luke chapter 17. I remember once when I was a young man, as all 18 and 19 year olds are, they're broke. I was broke. I was trying to date a very special young lady named Sarah, and I was broke. And someone asked me to help them move. In the middle of the week, of all things, and I said, well, I'm working. I can't help you move. I'm sorry. But after much pleading of a, such a difficult plight they were in, and there was no one to help them move, nobody. And I told them that I really needed to work. I was painting at the time. I could get the time off, but I really need to work. And after much begging, they said, we need you. We got nobody. We need you. Funny, I, I was the only arms and back around, I guess. Um, so I took a day off to help them move. In my mind, I'm thinking they'll probably float me a few dollars to help a young man out, you know. So I arrived there early in the morning, took the day off, day without pay, by the way. When you're working in the trades, you don't work, you don't get paid. And uh, I started helping them move. To my surprise, nothing was boxed up. So already my spirit's on edge. So I start boxing things up. At first very delicate, and then after a while, not so delicate. Just put it in the box and close it. It was a mother and a son, a single mother and a son. And to make matters worse, the son didn't help too much. And he was maybe 13, 14 years old. And I thought he could certainly bear some of this burden. But um, he didn't. And my level of frustration is increasing. I was getting the sense that I wasn't going to get any money. That became more evident as the morning wore on. And I realized the day financially was a loss. And so I just gave that to the Lord. But I was hoping for some pizza around 12 o'clock, at the very least, for some pizza. And no lunch came the day I helped this woman and her son, who will yet remain unnamed, uh, move. And when we finished loading up the truck, actually boxing up everything, loading up the truck, and most of it being done by myself. I told them we're all finished, and I wished them the best on their move, and I didn't even get a thank you when I left. And I still remember that today. We sort of groan about that, like that's even inhumane. But I'll bet you you have a similar story. 
of ingratitude. What we're going to read in the Bible is an instance of ingratitude that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Beginning in verse number 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Verse 12 of 17, Luke 17. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. I know many of us are familiar with this text. The story of the ten lepers that were cleansed, but only one returned to give thanks and glory to God. Can I talk for a few minutes about this one man that came back? This one man that came back had plenty to be thankful for. And I'll tell you what he had to be thankful for, at least what I jotted on my notes here. He could be thankful that Jesus cared about him. There's a lot of ambiguous things in the Bible, and in this story, uh, there are ambiguous things as well. This leper that was healed, who was a Samaritan, is unnamed. We do not know his name. Not only do we not know his name, but we don't even know the city he was from. The Bible just simply says that Jesus was passing through a certain village, and he saw these and came upon these ten lepers. And this leper was an outcast. No one talked to them. No one else cared about them. No one else spent time with them. No one else invested themselves in these lepers. They were cast outside of the city to stay in their little group of ten and no more. They didn't get to talk to someone who was clean and pure. They didn't get to talk to someone who did not have the disease of leprosy. And here is this one man who returned to thank God and certainly so because Jesus cared for him. I thank God that he cared for me. I don't have a big name. I got a popular name. There's too many Davises in this world. But I'm, I'm, no, I'm no pedigree. I, I don't have any 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 great stock for which I could claim. I didn't come from any big preacher's family or Christian family for that matter. But I'm glad Jesus cared about me. I grew up on a street off of Denison Avenue. Well, you'd be afraid to drive through there today. 69th Street off of Denison. That road was a dead end. And from all aspects of my life, my life looked like a dead end. Poor. My dad left when I was born, raised by a single mother with my grandmother, living in the upstairs of a duplex with cardboard over the windows. And my life looked like a dead end. But I'm glad Jesus cared for me. I think this man had a lot to be thankful for that Jesus would care. Care enough to speak to them. Care enough to minister to them. Care enough to heal him. I think he could be thankful that he saw Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't go to every town. He couldn't go to every town. He couldn't cover every town and province and village and city in Galilee or in, in Israel, much less the world. And what are the chances? What are the chances of Jesus Christ coming to his village. I think he was thankful that he was able to see Jesus Christ. As many of you know, I was a bus kid. I got saved through the bus ministry, and I rode the church bus all through my school years. 
When I became old enough, I began to work in the bus ministry and still rode the bus every Sunday morning and every Sunday afternoon. And you know, there were a lot of streets that that church bus didn't go down. But I'm glad it went down my street. I'm glad I was picked up and taken to church. I'm glad that Jesus saw me. I'm glad that the gospel reached me. I think this man can be thankful for the physical blessings. I mean, I'm talking about blessings in his body. We, we don't really understand. We're so far separated from leprosy. We don't understand how desperately heinous that disease is and was. Some diseases are on the inside and you can't see. Leprosy was on the outside. You couldn't hide it. You couldn't hide the sores. You couldn't hide the ooze. You couldn't hide the mucus that would come from your skin. You couldn't hide the disfigurement of your face as parts of your body would actually decay and fall off. Appendages, fingers, and hands, and, and, and nose, and ears. You'd lose those things as the leprosy would just eat your body. And it was visible from the outside. And couldn't you imagine, maybe this leper was so bad, his ear was gone, his nose was missing, missing some fingers, bandages wrapped all around his head, even around his head, so his eyes were just showing, and his faces, his hands are covered with the bandages. And here comes Jesus Christ and says, go show yourself to the priest. And as he goes, the Bible just simply says he was healed. You say, how far did the healing go? Could God put an ear back where it was? He did that one time. Amen. Remember Peter cut the ear off of that servant, that soldier, and Jesus just put it right back on. No stitches, no sutures, no glue, no doctor bill, praise God. Just put that ear right back on. Reattach the canal and all the things, just put the ear right back on. I'm telling you, this man experienced something in his body that was miraculous. Certainly it's something to thank God for. I thank God for my body. Look, I'm not a perfect specimen, you all know. You know, I'm, I'm getting a, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my 40s now. And all the ones in 60s and 70s laughing, you know. But I'm getting this belly. I mean, it's not as bad as James's belly, but I'm getting this belly. <laughs> And I'm losing my hair, and not as, not as bad as John Flanagan, but I'm losing my hair. <laughs> Who else should I mention? Who else am I mad at that I can say something about? <laughs> we all got something in the body we don't like, right? But we got plenty about this body to thank God for. We can see and hear and walk and touch and speak. As far as I know, I don't have cancer in my body. Praise God for that. As far as I know, I don't have, uh, you know, my, my heart isn't missing beats. Praise God for that. As far as I know, my kidneys are working the way they should. I praise God for that. I was able to put my shoes on and walk over here to church today. I praise God for that. I'm able to stand for a sustainable amount of time. I praise God for that in my body. I think if we're just going to look at the physical, we've got plenty to be thankful for in our bodies. And this man had a miracle done. And his body was made whole. And he returned to give thanks to God. Then I believe he can thank God for salvation. And you may not see it the same way I see it, but when Jesus healed the body, he also healed the soul. You read through the miracles of Jesus Christ. It wasn't only for the body. Jesus said, if you just care about this body and lose your soul, what have you got? So there's not anybody here that can convince me that as Jesus ministered, all he was worried about is healing a blind eye or making a deaf ear hear or making some lame feet gain strength or healing a leprous skin. That's all superficial. If Jesus didn't minister to the soul where the sin problem is, then what are we doing here? But he did minister to the soul. And it was this man's faith 
It was his peculiar faith. It was the faith that caused him to cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And I am thankful that any time someone with a sincere voice and a right heart calls upon Jesus Christ for mercy, he gives the mercy. Amen. And he gave it to this man. Salvation. Go and show yourself to the priest. By the way, just to sort of make this hopefully... Um, Maybe make a little bit more sense. I believe at this point in Luke 17, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. Verse number 1 tells us uh, in, um, or actually verse number 11 tells us in this text, it came to pass as he went to where? Jerusalem. And you all know what was going to happen there. He was going to be betrayed, a mock trial, beaten, abused, and crucified. And Jesus knows what's going to happen there, and he's heading there. He's heading there. He was on his way to Calvary, if you'll allow me to say it that, that way. He was on his way to Golgotha. He was making his way to that old rugged cross. And why would he do that? To heal leprosy? No, to heal the sin-sick soul. Amen. This man was born again. I think for a person to reject Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did on the cross is the epitome of ungratefulness. Now, I know there's my story about someone being unthankful. You probably got a story that tops that. But I'm telling you, someone who knows that Jesus died for them and knows that Jesus rose again for them and knows that Jesus suffered all that he suffered on Calvary's mountain for their salvation and to show an ungrateful turn toward that is, is I think, the epitome of, of pride and arrogance. And God help our heart or your heart if it's that way. This man was thankful for his salvation, what the Lord Jesus did in his, in his life. But if we're not careful, we'll miss the whole point of this story. You can miss the whole point. I can miss the whole point. I heard a story about a man who worked at the Border Patrol in Mexico. And it was his job to inspect the vehicles as they came across from Mexico and to find smuggled in contraband. This one particular man would always come across the border from Mexico, and this agent thought for sure he was smuggling something. So he would search, I mean, he would take off body panels, and I mean interior door panels, and bring the dogs in to, to search and, and uh, tear apart the headliner and, and look under the frame and just couldn't, and we, he would come weekly. This man would come across from Mexico every week. And every time this border agent thought, I know this guy's smuggling something. So he would search the truck and look under the bed and look in the glove box and, and uh, under the hood and in the engine compartments. Everywhere they would hide something to smuggle, he would search the truck. And week after week after week, this man would come and nothing. He just couldn't find a thing. Not one piece of contraband could he find being smuggled across as this man traveled across the Mexican border week after week. X-rays, sonar, nothing. So finally, after the Border Patrol agent retired, he heard the news that this same man was arrested. And he is so inquisitive. What was, they, they finally found him smuggling something. What was it? So he's, he's already retired. He called his colleagues and said, look, I knew that guy was, I knew he was smuggling something. I searched that uh, every time he came across. So what was he smuggling? And the border agent on the other SN said, he was smuggling in pickup trucks. <laughs> it's funny how you can search so hard for something, miss the obvious. You know what is the obvious lesson of this text? Is where are the The message of the text is not the one that came. The message of this text is where are the nine? It's like Jesus stands there stunned. He stands there amazed and maybe I'll take it a step further. Maybe he's even hurt. You say, does Jesus get hurt and offended? Well, he had, he had emotions. Maybe he stands a little hurt after having minister to 10 people after having, having poured himself into 10 people 
and then to hear him utter these sad, sad words, where are the nine? Yes, there was one, but there was a whole bunch that were missing. There are a couple things that God put on my heart, and I, they're sort of topical from this point on, and I ask the Lord to help me preach these things, and I pray that you'll bear with me. I want to ask this question, where are the soul winners? You say, we got some. We got some. But where are the nine? In other words, in the healing of these ten lepers, it should have been universal participation in the praise back to Jesus Christ. Am I right? It should have been universal on all ten that all ten of them would have ran back to Jesus Christ with a loud voice shouted and praised and all of them fell on their faces to thank Jesus for healing all ten of their bodies. It should have been universal participation. But there was only one. You know, sharing the gospel should be something universal in the church of God. Sharing the gospel with others who are lost should be something that has universal participation. But I've been saved long enough and been in the ministry long enough to wonder if Jesus hurts by saying, where are the nine? Oh, there's the one, there's the other, and there's a few. But where are the nine? Sharing our faith, Paul said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, and so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you also that are at Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I pray that we all believe that scripture. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But can I ask us all this question? I know it's going to hurt a little bit. Where are those passing out tracks? Do you know in my life, I can't think of one time I ever had anybody give me a gospel track. You say, well, aren't there people concerned about the lost? There are. But not the ten. You'll get to one or the other. You'll get a few, but not to ten. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. I'm convicted that I don't share the gospel enough. You say, well, I wouldn't be like one of those uh, lepers. I certainly would come back and praise God because I believe there should be universal participation, but there should be also in sharing the gospel. We have a debt to pay. You know there's two ways that you can have a debt. Um, let me try to illustrate uh, this today. Come on up, Brother Elliot, if you would. I'm going to try to illustrate. There's two ways to have a debt, okay? Actually, Matt, let me use you also. Come on up over on this side. All right, Elliot's going to be on this side. Matt's going to be on this side. Uh, if Elliot, because he's loaded, would loan me some money... <laughs> Yeah. He hides it really good, but he's loaded, let me tell you. If he would give me money and say, look, I need that back in a week, then I would have a debt to him to pay that back. Am I right? And I would feel that debt. I really would. Now, some people in this world don't feel it. We all know. But I would feel the debt that I've got to pay that back. I owe him that money. Okay? So Paul said, I am debtor both to the Greek, to the barbarian, to the wise, and the unwise. His debt to the Greeks and to the barbarians was not something that the Greeks and the barbarians gave him. When Paul said, I am, I am in debt to Greeks and to unlearned people to give them to the gospel, the, they did not give him the, the, he did not loan him the gospel, but he still said, I'm indebted. So the first way to get a debt is if he gives something to me and I've got to pay it back, that would be a debt. But that's not the kind of debt Paul's talking about. Let me explain it this way. Let's say that Matt borrowed some money from Elliot. He's loaning everybody money, so if you need some, see Elliot afterwards. Let's say that Matt borrowed some money from Elliot, 
and Matt wasn't going to see Elliot for a little while. Maybe he was out of town for a couple weeks. And Matt would come to me and say, Brother Greg, here's $100. I borrowed this from Elliot. When you see Elliot, give this back to him because I borrowed it from him. I'm giving it to you. Make sure you give that back to Elliot. I would say, okay. <laughs> and then I would spend it. He didn't loan me anything. But he gave me something that I've got to pass on. So next time I see Elliot, you know what I'm going to feel like. I'm going to feel like that tall. Because I know I owe him something. Now here's what's so cool. He doesn't even know I owe him something. Right? He's in the dark about the whole thing. He doesn't know I, that I, he, I have a debt to a Jew. Because it, it's these two. See? But I was involved in it because he gave it to me and said, give it to him. Now listen to me today. God gave us the gospel and said, you give it out there. And I'm telling you, every time we pass someone and don't tell them about Jesus Christ, it ought to eat us up inside. You say, why would it eat us up? Because he gave that to us. And we've got to give that out. It's our debt. But you know what we do? We spend our lives on nothing. We spend our lives on everything else. And we don't even think much about the debt we have to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, and to the unwise. But Paul understood that debt. Paul understood what God gave him. And Paul said this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And I am ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. I'm saying today, yeah, we got some soul winners. We got others that share the gospel, and occasionally we do it. But I'm saying, where are the ten? Where are the ten? You guys can be seated. Thank you. You both did a good job. Where are the ten? You know, we got friend day coming up. I take that back. Friend, family, and neighbor day. I want to sort of um, clarify some things. Because I, I've been coming to grips with some certain truths in my own life. You know, preachers learn. Do you know what I can't find in the Bible? I cannot find anywhere where we're told to build a church. And believe me, I've searched. Doesn't say that we're supposed to build a church. And we may get this misconception that pastor made up this whole friend, family, and neighbor day because he wants to build that church there in Carpenter Road. Nothing can be further from the truth. But I'll tell you what the Bible is very clear on. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not our job to build a church. It's our job to get people under the sound of the gospel and be saved. That's it. So I'm asking you today, how long has it been since you invited someone to come hear the gospel? I promise I'm going to preach the gospel clear and as best I can that Sunday morning the 9th. You got someone unsaved in your family, a neighbor that's lost? You say, well, there's other people inviting and there's other people sharing the gospel, but where are the nine? Isn't it something that should have universal participation? Maybe the Lord Jesus is hurt because where are the nine servants of God? Where are the nine servants? I was reading a hymn when I was preparing my message. Sometimes God will just bring a hymn to my mind and I'll start singing it and then I want to see the words to it. And You don't have to turn there, but I want you to listen to these words. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quicken from the dead. Now notice this question. I gave, I gave my life for thee. Does anybody know the last words? What hast thou given O oh, my Father's house of light, my glory's circled throne, I left for earthly night, for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left, I left it all for thee. What hast thou left for me? 
I'm telling you, that song's convicting, isn't it? In all my days of being a preacher of the gospel, one of my most quoted scriptures is this. Are you ready? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And when you really take a step back and look at that, shouldn't serving God be universal participation? Shouldn't serving the one who died for us and investing our life in the things that matter to him and reaching out in, in the work of the Lord, shouldn't that be universal 10 participation? But I believe with all of my heart that sometimes the Lord Jesus looks and he says, there's a few, but where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where are those that will pour their life into ministry and service? Where are those who will give themselves to a ministry and stay? Where are those who will say, yes, I've got some things to do, but I'm going to make sure that I find something for Christ that I'm accomplishing? Where is that today? I think the Lord Jesus looks around and says, where are the nine? Where are they? I also want to ask this, where are the unashamed? Did you notice in our text, we'll sort of round back to the, to the passage where we were, and we'll end here in Luke chapter number 17. I mentioned this to the teens this morning. When this one man was healed, the Bible says that he turned back. Uh, we're in verse number um, 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. And you see what it says? No, it was a very respectful, amen. <laughs> I like to sort of picture what was happening here. What, 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 kind of, what kind of noise was happening? I mean, this man was just healed. This man was just, the leprosy is gone and my body is made whole. And there, I believe there wasn't any formalism in his return. I believe he didn't have to have an outline on what to say. I'm going to do point number one and then point number two. I'm going to back it up with this and I'm going to go over there. I believe this man didn't even have to put an outline together. His heart was pouring out. He didn't have to learn a chorus to sing praise to God. He was going to sing something. He was going to say something. And the Bible says it wasn't just any voice. It says that he... Uh, cried out and turned and said with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet giving him thanks and he was a Samaritan now this even opens it up worse because Samaritans hated Jews and here's this Samaritan who knows in his heart if I kneel in front of a Jew that is anathema where I come from and if I fall on my face in front of this Jewish man, I'm going to be embarrassed to the nth degree. And if I cry out with a loud voice, probably my friends are going to hear who are all backslidden and going toward the priest and won't even turn around. They ain't going to be good. I'll lose all the ten friends I got. He had plenty of reason to show gratitude. And he did it in an unashamed way. Where are the unashamed? We're becoming more ashamed of our faith all the time. If you're saved and not baptized, you should get baptized. And I'll tell you why. Because it's, it's one of those things you do to say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Is it hard? Do you get wet? Yep. but I'm not ashamed. Can we publicly confess Christ? Will we say without any shame at all and say, look, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. He's got my life. I'm trying to live for him. I'm not the same. Or are we still secret about the whole thing? I'll even share something else. I think we're sometimes ashamed to come to the altar. And I know it's not, you know, physically maybe sometimes there isn't, but I think some of us here today, there's a little bit of shame that I just don't want people seeing me. I don't want people seeing me kneel. I don't want people seeing me pray. I don't want people seeing me. Well, if, if we're not 
if we're uneasy about Christians seeing us pray, we'll never pray out there. Never. Never. May God give us sort of like this man. And I, this man wasn't ashamed. He just wasn't so excited about what had happened in his life that he couldn't hold it in and had to cry out with a loud voice. Are there some people that aren't ashamed? Oh, there's always those. There's always those who will just jump out there for the Lord. I've got a friend of mine who I just talked to this week. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. His name was Don Weeks. And he said, uh, he's pastoring in West Virginia. He said, I'm going to start a new ministry. He said, I'm going into evangelism. I, th- I said, well, that's cool. He says, it's not evangelism like you think. He says, I'm not doing evangelism here. I'm doing evangelism in the no man land. And I'm thinking, well, there's no love offerings out there in the no man land. Churches give you love offerings. But he said, I want to be an evangelist, and I want to go to the village and the city and the place and the tribe. I don't care if there's five people or 15 people. I want to go where nobody goes. He says, I want to take my shoes off and cross the river. I want to sleep on a, on a bed of dirt. I want, to, I want to part the grass from my mattress so I can take the gospel to someone who would likely never hear it otherwise. He said, that's the evangelism I want to do. And you know what? There's always a few of those around. Don Weeks is a unique man. There's always a couple guys who just say, look, I'm unashamed, I'm unafraid, I'm going to blast through the, the fires, just anything for my Savior I'm in. There's always a couple. But I wonder if the Lord Jesus sometimes with a heavy heart says this, but where are the nine? Didn't I save ten? Didn't I redeem ten? Didn't I give salvation to ten? Didn't I bless ten? Didn't I heal ten? Didn't I pour myself into ten? Oh, there's always a couple. But where are the nine? Where are the nine? I pray that God would help us to sort of jump on the side of universal participation. Universal. We're all in. We're all in. Can we bow our heads for prayer quietly today? Where are the nine? Where are those nine? Were there not ten cleansed? Can I ask today, this, we may have 150 here. We might have 150 people here in church today, maybe 160, who knows. And of this group, I don't know, can we say there's 130 saved, born again people here? We don't know, I, I don't know who's saved, but let's just say for a number, 130 saved. I wonder if Jesus looks down at 130 people and wonders, how come so few of that 130? How come so few are in the Word of God? How come so few of them spend time in prayer? How come so few of them pass out a track or share the gospel? How come so few of them ever invite anybody to church? How come so few of them are really energized and unashamed of Jesus Christ? How come so few? If you're unsaved today, I want you to know the same healing this man received for his soul, you can have as well. Cry out to Jesus for mercy, he'll save you. Can we stand quietly with our heads bowed? Father, I thank you for this old familiar story. And I do commend this one leper. He's an inspiration to me. I think he's an inspiration to many of us to make sure that we have a grateful heart, not to be an ungrateful wretch, but to be a thankful person, to have regular times where we loudly praise God and thank him for his mercy. But Father, maybe for those other things in life that we sometimes become more like the nine rather than the one. We'd rather stay in the group of nine than the one and just sort of 
fail to universally participate in that which we know we ought to do. Sharing the gospel, passing out a track, inviting someone to church, being in the word of God, praying, lifting our voice in praise, and showing the love of Christ. Father, help us to be more on the universal participation side. Bless this invitation, I pray. Use it according to your will. We offer thanks today for all that you've done in us and through us. And pray that we'd be worthy servants in return. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, it's an opportunity to pray and just talk to the Lord and make some things right and recommit some things at times. I gave my life to thee. What hast thou given to me? That's page number 543 in your hymn book. Why don't we sing a few stanzas of this today? 543, if you need it, I gave my life for thee. Will you join me, please? I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. That thou mightst ransom me and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave heads are bowed once more and eyes are closed. She'll play through just a verse more. That will be all. Can you, while you're praying and our heads are bowed, can we at least say a prayer today and say to the Lord Jesus Christ that that by his grace will not be part of the nine of neglect but will be part of the one of action. Not part of the nine of apathy part of the group of interest, enthusiasm, excitement for Jesus Christ. seated, but Brother Matt's going to come with the annou announcements. Uh, ushers, could you make sure that um, when the service is concluded that a couple of you are standing back there with those flyers for a friend, family, and neighbor's day. Uh, Brother Matt will announce it again. If you'd like to take a couple flyers to invite a friend, a family, or a neighbor for July the 9th, uh, the men will have the flyers in the back. There's some also on the table here, uh, but um, let's pray for God to give us a great day on the 9th. It'd be great to see someone saved on the 9th, wouldn't it? See someone trust Christ as their Savior, someone you've been praying for, someone you invited to come, that we've invited. Uh, so please, uh, those flyers will be available in the back. Brother Matt.